today is, of course, we all know when we walk out on our beautiful beach that it is no more. And uh, we are beach erosion and the lake waters, and we are very, very privileged to have Sarah, who's representing Roger, uh, to come and speak to us about what's happening to our beach and Lake Michigan. We are also going to have Aaron from the park and Stephen from the park, and Tim Smith is supposed to be here. I don't know what he looks like, so I'm not quite sure if he's here or not. But um, he was going to answer questions about installing the brick brack system, which is what really has been recommended by the DNR. Um, so I think this is a really interesting um, presentation. Uh, Thank you so much for coming and taking your time. Um, I hope we learn a lot. Uh, this is a very, very special community. It's a very special beach. And uh, I think that's why Roger uh, decided to do it. Uh, when I called Roger, he actually did our beach 33 years ago. And, uh, he's a, and he also saved my father's dog. So we have a kind of a special connection. Um, so when I called Roger and asked him for questions, I was just really asking him, you know, what can I say to my, uh, to uh, the community of Whitefish Bay about what's happening to our beach? He said, "There's," he said, "I am coming to talk because this is such a crucial uh, topic." He said, "We are ba almost in crisis mode, um, and this is so important." And also, Whitefish Bay is a very special community to him because. Uh, of the way it's structured. So, um, so I was kind of blown away. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe you volunteered to do this. But uh, anyway, he had a family emergency, so he couldn't come. So he's giving Sarah, his, who's worked for him for 16 years, she's amazing, and she's basically going to give the speak, this talk that Roger would have given. Um, and I also was able to talk to uh, a couple people that DNR in um, in Madison, and I can't tell you how great the DNR has been and what amazing organization they are. They gave me so much information, and they were so cooperative, and they just really want the best for our beach. And so they sent out uh, a couple, uh, uh, how to apply for the permits, and also some articles that I think everyone sent via email of just to, uh, what's going on in the beach. And, I just was really impressed by them, and they were just so helpful, and they called me back right away, and they wish they could have come and, and, and um, talk, but they are overwhelmed with calls. When a storm comes by, they get 150 calls a day from everyone around Wisconsin, and they're out and about checking all these beaches, so they were a little overwhelmed, so that's why they couldn't come. So, but we've got Sarah, and here she is, and she's going to do this great presentation. And I do think we have some visitors here from other communities. So uh, when, after Sarah speaks and uh, Aaron and Stephen speaks, I think we'll just take like a little break so they can go, and then we can do our Whitefish Bay Association meeting. So they don't really need to stay for that. So um, thank you so much. And from the other members of the other community, thank you for coming. I think the more we share our information, the better it is. Um, this is really an important uh, uh, subject for all of Door County. And of course, today there was um, flooding in Fish Creek, and uh, we have a water advisory out in Lake Michigan for high water. So today's a good day. So here's Sarah. Miller Engineers and Scientists, been in business in Wisconsin since 1961. We have done hundreds of beaches and shoreline restoration work all over the Midwest. We've done beaches in Door County. I am born and raised in Door County. I'm a Bayside girl. So I'm Fish Creek Way, sorry. We have smaller waves over there, warmer water. Um, but we're really familiar with this. We've been working in Door County for decades, and we really wanted to take some time and educate people on what's happening at the lake and what you can maybe do to help protect your capital investments along the lakefront. Lake Michigan water levels, since 1860, this blue line is average annual, not high-low for the year, but an average for the year. If you can see 1986, when we did the Quinlan's revetment, we were at 582. Um, in June of this year, we were at 581.9. We see la lake level fluctuations of about six feet. That's absolutely normal and within the realm of what happens on Lake Michigan all the time. We went 
in seven years, we went six feet, which is a little bit much for us. We're not used to seeing it quite that drastic. Um, but you can see, this goes back 5,000 years for lake levels. <laughs> this is our current blip from 1860 to today. Absolutely within the realm of normal. Actually, normal gets a lot bigger and a lot smaller than what we're seeing. Um, the Army Corps has predicted a fluctuation of approximately nine to 10 feet as being normal or plausible within Lake Michigan. So what we're seeing now is well within that. Um, Army Corps has predicted that we could go up to 584, and that's fairly normal for Lake Michigan. You can see we, we've been higher than that in the past, distant past, but it, it does happen. Beach dynamics. Lake Michigan is a dynamic beach. You're not living on an inland lake. This is a lake that you see these fluctuations happening all the time. There are a lot of things that contribute to that. Um, by dynamic, we're talking about the fluctuating water levels is a big component of that. That's what everyone's concerned about right now. Um, high wind speed during storms really impacts that. Um, dune grass, everyone wants to take away their dune grass. They want this pristine beach full of sand. The dune grass holds your sand in place when the waves hit. If you get rid of the dune grass, you lose the beach. You have to have that dune grass in place in order for the beach to stay in periods of high water. Um, the waves will pull the sand into the near shore bottom, but there's also littoral drift, so you lose sand sideways. On Lake Michigan, on our shoreline, we tend to lose it southward because most of our wind comes from the north. So the sand kind of, and you'll see that in Whitefish Bay, you get more sand on the south. And it, sorry, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so we have redistribution by waves. So the water will come up and it'll pull the sand into the near shore bottom. It'll also redistribute it to your neighbors north or south. Lake Michigan on our side tends to move south, but it does happen in both directions. Erosion of land, whether you're a sand beach or a, a bluff on the shoreline, the waves have an impact. They will pull some of that away. You will lose land over time. It happens. As the water levels go down, I'll show you on the next couple of slides, that'll all kind of come back. But it is very dynamic. Those shorelines move. That's, you can't control Lake Michigan. That's not going to stop. It's going to keep happening. It's something we just have to be aware of. We have to plan our capital investments because of it or around it. And we have to find a way to protect those investments. Littoral drift is that movement of sand sideways. Again, in Lake Michigan, it tends to move south. This is what happens with changing water levels in the lake. When you have a low water level like 2012, we were pretty low. We had all these beautiful beaches. Everyone was really happy except for the people that were trying to launch boats, and the boat launch didn't make it to the lake. <laughs> a lot of questions about that back then. Um, so when you have the low water levels, you have this berm, which is kind of that swash zone. The swash zone is where your wet sand is when the wave action is hitting. Um, that's also where the bacteria live. Don't play in the wet sand. Um, but you'll have this little berm where that swash zone is, and then you have the beautiful dune with the dune grass. Shows you the big, beautiful, rolling beach. As the water levels come up, it pulls that berm down, and it kind of scarps out or carves out that dune a little bit. What's happening is most of that sand is coming down and creating a shallower profile of the lake. That shallow profile of the lake helps with the wave action. The steeper the slope of the lake, the harder the waves hit the land. The harder the waves hit the land, the more sand moves out. So your sand is protecting itself. It's gonna lower itself, nice, perfect little profile, and it'll create this area. You see sandbars. When the waters rise, you see more of those sandbars happening. That's just the sand storing itself until the next time the water comes down and it'll come back up. So you see the big surges, all of a sudden your dune is gone, a lot of your dune grass is gone. Again, that sand is just hiding out here. It's waiting, it'll come back. Excuse me. When the water levels go back down again, which they will, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, they're gonna go back down sooner or later. That sand, the wind will blow it back up, it traps in the dune grass, the dune grass holds the sand in place, your beach comes back. Happens over and over and over again. We've seen it in the last 100 years. We've seen it in the last 5,000 years. It's gonna happen again. The problem is whether or not your house or your boathouse 
or your stairs to the lake are going to be there when it does. <laughs> Louder? Okay. That's okay. This is a picture in Sheboygan, right next to our office. This is actually Roger's house. Um, back in 2012, low lake levels. This is what everyone's used to seeing. You have that beautiful beach. Here's that little berm with the swash zone right there. Nice long flat sand dune grass making the sand stay in place so that as the wind picks up, the sand isn't going into your yard, it's staying in the, in the beach area. This is about 2015, same exact spot. You can see all of a sudden that berm went from out here to up here. We've lost a lot of the beach, the dune grass is still there, still trapping the sand, everything's healthy. And what we did is this is a revetment that we built in front of Roger's house decades ago. We didn't build the revetment out here to hold the sand in place because the sand has to be able to move. You have to be able to see that sand go back and forth. We build the revetment as far inland as possible. Um, let the beach dynam be dynamic. Let it move, let it fluctuate. It has to be able to do that. It balances itself. It's bigger than us. It knows what it's doing. Let it do its job. Protect your house, but protect it inland. This is last year. Couldn't get the same shot because we would have been standing in about three feet of water. <laughs> so we're back up a little farther. Um, the revetment's actually back here. And you can see what that dune grass does. It is trapping the sand. It's preventing that sand from washing out too much. It's protecting your investment inland. It's holding everything in place. You need that dune grass there to keep the sand in place. This is you guys, right here. Um, lake levels are the big thing that everyone's talking about right now. That is the only thing that we need to be aware of. Um, there are things that exacerbate that that you're seeing right now. And that's basically driven by deep water wave height. Um, the wave height in deep water is driven by wind speed, wind direction, and fetch length. Fetch length is basically where the wind hits the water first and how far it can go before it hits you. You guys have some fairly large fetches. Good news is the wind usually blows to the west, not the east, so it's not as bad as it could be. Um, <laughs> but the, the big thing to be aware of is when those storms hit, when you get those bigger waves from the wind speeds, they're building miles out and they're coming in. And what you see is in the deep water waves, and Roger had a slide in here that actually went through the calculation to figure this out. I took that slide out because that's not what I'm gonna speak about today. <laughs> um, that's why he's got those letters after his name. So in deep water, the wind will blow through and it creates this orbital velocity. Waves move in circles, right? And as long as that circle can make its circle underwater, the waves just keep rolling. As Soon as that circle hits a sandbar, the wave will break. So the more velocity you have in that wave, the farther out they break. As they break, they're changing those sandbars, they're moving the sand around on the bottom, and you can see the wave energy, as they start to break, the wave energy comes down, and if you have this nice natural shoreline where the sand has made its home and it knows what it's doing, you have this nice shallow beach right here, and the wave energy is next to nothing. It's not causing as much damage when you have that nice shallow bed. You can't have a flat shoreline, one, because it doesn't work, and two, because your swash zone will be a mile wide and you will have bacteria everywhere. But that shallow profile is kind of critical to maintaining a positive beach. This is significant wave height on an annual basis at the North Buoy, which is right about here. So the North Buoy is in your fetch line. That's a good indicator of how much wave action you're getting or how much wave energy there is moving towards your property right now. You can see June, July, August, it's actually pretty low. We see them more because we're here more and we're out playing on the beach and we notice what's happening those waves get significantly higher in the fall. So the damage you're seeing happen today 
is going to get worse this fall. History tells us that those waves are going to get bigger, the wind is going to blow harder, we're going to see more damage coming in the next few months. If that sounds scary. There are ways that we can help remediate that a little bit. But be aware that historically speaking, the waves get bigger, October, November. By December, January, hopefully we've got a little bit of ice out there. So they're just building on the ice instead of hitting your land. But it does happen. Again, here's that fetch from up in the north buoy. This is you guys. We see the, the wind hitting those deep water waves. They come in, and you guys are actually this beautiful little isolated cell along the county. You've got this nice rock point here. You've got protection down here. Your sand stays in place. If you were an open reach, a truly open reach on Lake Michigan, your sand would be down here. You're keeping your sand in your little protected cell of Whitefish Bay. So it's easier to kind of redistribute it through the area as the water levels go back down. You're not losing as much of it to that littoral drift as the wave action is big and the, the lake levels are higher. There you guys are, and you can see you're losing sand up here. You're getting more sandbars down here. It is staying in place. You get some migration southward, but not to the extent that a lot of the open reaches get. This happens to be, um, we've been talking to some of you already. We've had um, site visits and meetings with a few of you to talk about revetments and, and how to protect your land. Um, this is, is Susan here? Susan, hi, I was on your property the other week taking pictures. <laughs> um, this is typical shoreline. You guys see this, you look out your windows, this is what it looks like. There's no revetment there. You have 10, 15 foot drops from your dunes to the lake right now. And it's eroding and eroding and eroding and it, it becomes very concerning when you see it getting closer and closer to your house and you say, at what point is this gonna stop? I, I couldn't get down to the bottom of your beach, Susan. I was afraid. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I stayed on the top and took pictures. Um, <laughs> um, this is, I think this is along the Quinlan shoreline. Okay, we did do a revetment here in 1986-87, and you can see the revetment. It's way back in here. It's just starting to actually function as a revetment. That's okay. The house is protected, the revetment is there, by the time the waves hit this point, they're bouncing back, they're gonna scour the shoreline a little bit, but they're not gonna take the house with them. The good news is, we left a lot of room there for the lake to do its thing, for the sand to be able to redistribute, to create that nice shallow profile so that the waves aren't causing as much damage. This is a typical revetment, someone who will build a stone or concrete structure into the lake. And I understand the primary concern is, keep the waves away from my house. I don't want to lose my house. The problem is, again, when you look at this wave energy, as the waves come in and they start breaking over the, de or the sandbars, if they hit this and they're not at that shallow profile, all of that wave energy is reflected back. So the wave will hit here, it bounces back, and what that does is it ends up scouring the bottom of the lake. That scour will cause your revetment to fail. And sooner or later, it's gonna undercut it. You're gonna have to repair that revetment, which is a significant investment. Secondary to this is that littoral drift issue. When you build a structure like this into the lake, this scour will also happen to the people downdrift of you. Again, those are your southern neighbors. They're not going to be happy when they lose their house because that revetment is in the lake. We have to make sure that we are building these protective structures as far inland as we possibly can. You don't want it to fail, and it's going to fail. You can't build it deep enough to make that not happen. It's going to affect your southerly neighbors. The northern neighbors are probably going to be kind of happy because it's going to trap sand for them. It's also going to trap Cladophora for them, so it may smell kind of bad. 
Um, but the southern neighbors are going to have problems if you do this. <coughs> Excuse me. Old structures that are near the lakeshore right now. You have a boathouse that's sitting right on the edge. We need to plan for that boathouse to move. I know that we want to keep our property, we want to keep as much of that shoreline as possible, but we have to be prepared to move some of those structures inland if possible. If not, there are ways to, to provide a revetment, a buried revetment that will have that sand movement. Um, the, we have permitted them through the DNR, we've done it. But if, it, if it's a structure that's 150 years old, you're thinking about maybe rebuilding it in 20 years anyway, let's talk about rebuilding it today. Let's move it inward, let's protect the shoreline on a comprehensive or reach basis. We have done community-wide or reach-wide revetments where you can start at the northern extent and design a, a continuous revetment along the entire reach. You build it at the same distance from the lake, at the same slope, at the same depth, so that it acts as a natural shoreline. Like any other sand beach that has rock or limestone behind it. This is one that we did in Sheboygan. Um, this is a multi-million dollar resort complex that was built. But we worked with the city over the course of three years and actually built a revetment from this point all the way down through here. There's a buried revetment behind that entire thing. Most of the community does not even know that there is a revetment there. It's a sand beach. They go play on the beach, they have picnics with their kids, it looks beautiful, it looks natural, it functions like any other beach, but those investments are protected. If the waves get very high, we get storm surges in October at a high lake level, everyone starts panicking, it's protected, the revetment is there, it's okay. The rest of the time it acts like a natural lake shore, you get the, you get the little dunes and the, the ridges in the, in the lake, everything functions as it should. So, the big thing here is don't build a hard structure in the lake. It's bad for the lake, it's bad for your property, it's bad for your neighbors. Let's build it inland a little bit. Make sure that you are protected at those critical high water storm surge moments. You're not gonna lose your house, you're not gonna lose your investment. Let the lake do its thing. Um, shoreline hardening, that's those hard revetments. I don't know, have any of you ever taking a vacation to Lake Erie? Anybody? <laughs> it's, um, there's, there's, not, there's not a ton of natural beaches. That shoreline has become very hardened over the years. And what happens is, and we've seen it down Mequon Way as well, um, someone will build a structure into the lake that starts scouring the lake, starts scouring the southerly neighbors. All of a sudden, the southerly neighbors are in panic mode. They build a hard structure and it starts scouring the lake and scouring their southerly neighbors, and you get revetment after revetment after revetment jutting into the lake. Now you have increased wave action, you have more damage to the properties, and you're starving the lake of the sand it needs to create that shallow bed profile in order to reduce the wave energy. If you put that structure into the lake, it can no longer balance itself out. It needs to do that in order for us to stay safe, so the, those hard structures in the lake become an epidemic. It's like a little disease that spreads along the lakeshore. So we need to make sure that we're not doing that, that we're not starving our lake of sand, and that we're not creating more damage with higher wave action. Um, statutes have changed on setbacks on lot lines on Lake Michigan recently. We used to have them set at 100 feet. Um, I don't remember the year exactly, but it's been within the last few years, they've reduced it to 75 feet. The reason they reduced it to 75 feet was to maintain continuity with inland lakes. If you can build on Lake Winnebago at 75 feet, you can build on Lake Michigan at 75 feet. That's a bad idea. Lake Winnebago is a lake. Lake Michigan is a freshwater ocean. Totally different dynamic. You can't stop Lake Michigan from changing its water levels. You can't stop the storms from happening and making that wave energy hundreds of miles out and blowing in at you. It's not the same thing. Don't, don't build your house 75 feet from the lake. If, if you want that view, we can change the grades on your lot. We do it all the time. Totally feasible. 
don't build your house 75 feet from the lake. We're right now in a sequence of high water levels, which we kind of are assuming are gonna be the case for the next couple decades. I don't, I don't think we're gonna see another six foot drop in the next year or two. Um, we're seeing annual precipitation rising. It has for the last century. I don't see any change in that happening anytime soon, so we're getting more rain. We have warmer, wetter summers. Lake levels are going up. There's been some discussion about the lake doesn't freeze, which means we have more evaporation in the winter months, but as long as it stays wetter than the amount that's evaporating in the winter, they're going up. If that happens, the lake levels are gonna keep getting higher. Army Corps said 584 is a plausible high. That's still two feet in vertical. Two feet in vertical on a shallow shoreline is a lot of your investment, that's a lot of your land. Let's plan for something in the, in the happy medium there, build that revetment, get your investments protected, let the lake do its thing, let's not scour out the rest of the lake, let's not build these big structures into the lake, let it, let it do its thing, let it find its happy medium and its nice shallow shoreline profile again. Once it finds that profile, those lake levels, regardless of how high they are, the wave energy is less as it hits the shoreline, you're gonna have less damage. So Roger's big thing, <laughs> he talked to the Army Corps and asked them when they were implementing their emergency K procedure. This was something developed back in the 60s. And the guy he talked to at the Army Corps said, what's that? <laughs> what emergency K procedure? So Roger had this big conversation with him and um, all, of, all of the lakes are seeing this. Lake Superior is out falling. You know, they're at maximum capacity, they're throwing water our way. St. Lawrence Seaway is at maximum capacity. They're worried about flooding. So kind of all of the water is backing in towards us, and here it sets. All of the procedures that are in place through the International Joint Council, all of those lake level management and operating plans right now have been designed for maximum water level for shipping. They were put into place decades ago. Shipping was booming. That was their primary concern. Let's get goods around the lake. They haven't changed, they haven't updated them. So we need to be having conversations with our state governments, with our local governments, with our federal governments and saying, hey, things have changed, the lake levels are high, we need to get these procedures in place, we need to know what they are, let's have this conversation, let's let IJC do what it needs to do, and let's make sure that we have emergency plans in place because that changes the funding structure, that changes the permitting structure, that changes how quickly and easily we are allowed to help you design a structure that's gonna protect your investment. Um, I will say we've never had a permit application denied with the DNR. They're very helpful. They understand what's going on. They're knowledgeable. Um, they're, they're a lot more likely to do it on a public reach than a private reach. Um, but again, we've, we've never seen one denied. We've never seen one come back and say, nope, you can't protect your house. We want the lake to stay natural. They understand. They work with us. The permitting process is fairly straightforward. Um, a lot of times you'll have to reapply. Um, as the lake levels go up, you get your permit to put your revetment in. As the lake levels go down, you get a dredging permit because you want to pull a lot of that sand back and make it pretty a lot faster than the, the wind is going to do for you. We've never had one of those denied either. Um, they work with you. It, as long as you can show them that you have a, a solid plan and that you're not going to destroy your neighbor's property, <laughs> they, they, they work with us. They work with you. You can, you can do this. Um, it is possible for community-wide designs to happen. We've done them for one homer, homeowner, we've done them for five homeowners, we've done them for an entire community. You can do this design, you can work with your neighbors. I will tell you, if you get five neighbors involved, you have one design fee, you have one construction fee, you know you're not paying for mobilization, demobilization, and materials for five different projects. So if you like your neighbors, you guys work well together, you might want to consider working with them to develop one shoreline plan that will protect your investments, that will help the lake do its thing, 
and you may be able to see some cost savings, recognize some cost savings in the process. So that's my I'm not Roger speech. I hope you guys could hear me. If not, um, we will have the presentation up online. This will be available on YouTube where the microphone works. <laughs> and I believe it was broadcast on the Sevastopol TV station as well. So there are other ways to access this. If you still have questions, I have a bunch of get out of jail free cards. These are the, my name is Sarah Kellner, I'm not Roger Miller, so if you have a question that I can't answer, you can contact me and I will get him in touch with you and, and we can help you figure it out. experiences with developing stone steps to the lakefront. Uh, we've done them. Um, anything that you build onto the lake is a temporary structure. You may, you may pretend that it's a permanent structure and it may be in your lifetime. You may never see those stones move. It's a temporary structure. Um, and it, you know what happens is those bottom few stones, we just had one this year, those bottom few stones will move. You wait for the lake levels to calm. You reinforce and you put them back up. You, you can do it, they're, they're gonna move though. I've never seen a set that didn't at some point. Depends on how mad the lake is. Um, the, she's a powerful beast and if she has it in her mind to move your steps, I've seen them last less than a year. I've seen ones that have been there for 25. Yes? <laughs> Hang on, let's go back a few slides. Um, and is there a natural mechanism for it to not go above the stone? Well, in theory, the natural mechanism is the St. Lawrence Seaway. In theory, when we reach a high level, the water goes out that way. The problem is that they're already at maximum capacity. Right. So we need, to, we need to change that mechanism. We need to help the government understand that that mechanism maybe needs to be updated or looked at a little bit more closely. Um, there is a mechanism in place, and if worse comes to worse, someone's gonna get flooded. Um, so this was us 1986. Extreme high was 582.35. The annual high was lower than our annual high right now. So you can see that we are at an annual average high water level higher than 1986 as of today. We have not seen the extreme high that we saw. That extreme high happened in October when that wave energy is higher. You see those, those greater winds coming in, the wave energy gets bigger. Our high hasn't happened yet this year. So be aware of that. The, the Army Corps has published a plausible extreme high range of almost 584. Now, this was published not this year. <laughs> so that is probably subject to change at this point. But they have published, you know, it, they have like almost a 10-foot fluctuation in lake levels as plausible. Um, you know, you go back a few thousand years, and it, it does go higher than that. We haven't seen anything much higher than 584 for the last 3,000 years. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think 584 is probably fairly safe, at least short term. The problem is that our climate is a little bit different than it's been for the last 3,000 years. So as we get warmer, as we get wetter, as we get more temperate, that's gonna adjust a little bit. I have a yes. basement that's at 583 and a half, a finished basement, built 20 years ago, because that's what the code let you do. Mm -hmm. You're telling me we might hit a 580. Will my sump pump keep that water out of my basement? Or if the lake gets to 584, is my basement going to be wet no matter what I do? How close is your house to the lake? 125 feet. How big is your sump pump? <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's not as big as Lake Michigan, that's why. <laughs> and its name is not God. <laughs> There's 
my there's my get out of jail. Right. There's my get out of jail free. I'm I'm not sure that your sump pump is going to keep Lake Michigan from your basement. There are probably ways to to I said there are ways to help facilitate that. Um, but you can you can get in touch with me and I'll get you in touch with Roger and he'll talk your ear off and save your dog and tell you all about it. Anybody else? Questions? You know, you don't want Phragmites on your beach. We all know that. And I think Bob Boltman, our resident expert on invasives, is standing at the back in the brown hat next to the birdhouse. If you have questions, if you have questions on Phragmites or invasives, he's the guy. He knows more than anyone I know on managing that stuff. Um, dune grass is called dune grass for a reason. Um, it, it creates those dunes. Those dunes are your bank of sand during high water levels. You don't want to lose that bank of sand. You know, the dunes create this false high on your shoreline that you need when you get those extreme scour moments. Then the dune collapses a little bit, the grass falls in. But if you have no dune grass there, you're going to have a flat beach and it's going to blow away in the next storm. It's going to wash away in the next storm. That dune grass is critical to keeping your sand in place. Every beach we have ever designed, and we have designed hundreds of them for restoration purposes along the Great Lakes, every beach includes dune grass. You cannot have a long-term beach without dune grass, not on Lake Michigan. Is there a rule to get dune There are. <laughs> um, the DNR, you need a... Um, well, it depends on how you're grooming, if you're grooming mechanically or if you're grooming by hand, but there are limits to what you can remove as far as size, and there are limits to how you can remove it based on whether you're above or below the ordinary high water mark. If you're below the ordinary high water mark, you need a permit to do it. Um, and they're a little bit more stringent on those permits. But that being said, they, they do say, nobody wants to sit on really sharp grass all summer long. They will allow you to remove some extent of it. Um, I think. On that, I will give you my get out of jail free card and I, I can get you the information. I did not bring it with me. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, most beaches, ev everyone likes to play in the swash zone. As long as the swash zone is not in a stormwater outfall, you're okay. Um, the problem I see is you go to a beach that has an outfall pipe close by and you see that warm water that makes this little river on the beach and everyone sends their toddlers to play in that water because it's nice and warm and they can't drown and everything's great. It is a cesspool. <laughs> that water is so full of bacteria and contamination. It is the dirty water running off your streets that your children are playing in. If you wouldn't let them lick the puddle on the street, don't let them play in that water. <laughs> Um, but that being said, on a, on a typical beach where you have a parking lot or your driveway, you've got 25, 30 feet of sand before that swash zone, that water is infiltrating into that dune grass, the root system is cleaning everything out, it's passing through all of that sand, it's perfectly fine. The contamination you see in the lake is not coming from Michigan, it's not coming from Chicago, it's not coming from Gary, Indiana. The solution to pollution is dilution. By the time it reaches us, it's negligible. 
The bacteria that you see on your lakes today is coming from your driveway or your street or your parking lot and the birds. Yes? So we have a property that creates a lot of lakes. Yeah. Our property has to be okay. to the bacteria. Is no. Um, it's really those stormwater outfalls where you're taking water from a street and pouring it onto the lake. <laughs> those are the ones you have to be concerned of. Most creeks, the water's flowing, it's not stagnant. There's, there's wildlife and vegetation in there to clean the water out, perfectly fine. Just don't let them play next to those big metal pipes with the really warm water at the beach. That's what you have to be concerned about. So Sebastopol collects the water on Bark Road, runs through your sewer on my property, and delivers it down to the boat dock where it's So they, they have an alcohol pipe at the boat dock? Does it go into the lake or is it on the lake? Into the lake. So well, it's, no, it's it's stop short. It's not the lake. It's the beach and it goes into the lake. Um, you know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong. I would just say, you know, don't play in the water right by the outfall. Most communities are doing sanitary surveys on all of their beaches. The biggest problem that you have is within 24 hours of a rain event. And we used to see the signs all over Door County where the beaches were closing all the time. We actually worked with Door County Soil and Water Conservation Department back in 2006. We redesigned 11 beaches in Door County to mitigate that stormwater pollution so that the beaches wouldn't close. It's been wildly successful. The beaches are not closing because we're treating that water before it hits the lake. Um, and that's as easy as, you know, you can either put a lot of capital investment in it and pipe it out 200 feet into the lake, or you can bring it back a little bit and create a, like a rain garden swale type feature where that water goes into a garden, the roots and the plants actually will filter most of the media out and the water's clean by the time it leaves that garden and hits the lake. It's not a huge capital investment to fix that, but I will also say that they're probably monitoring their beach and as long as you're not swimming on the beach within a couple hours of a rain event, you're probably fine. Sarah for that. The other Sarah in our office is the ecologist and she could speak to that much better than I could. Um, you know, the world changes and, and wildlife adapts. As long as you have a beach ecosystem, yes. things are likely to survive. If you, again, if the biggest concern in my world on the engineering end of things is if you put that hard structure into the lake and now you're changing the ecosystem, you're going to have issues. Um, how the lake levels are fluctuating and changing ecosystems on a natural basis. They may be losing some habitat. They may be creating some habitat for other species. Bob might actually be able to address that slightly better than I could. It's a tough, it's a tough time to be a piping like dune grass will expand vertically. So <laughs> as the dune grass catches sand and the sand buries it, it just keeps growing. Um, 
So uh, the dune grass will hold the sand in place, the sand will cover the dune grass, the dune grass will grow through the sand. It will also grow horizontally, it spreads, the rootstock is really hardy. Um, so you can see it washing out into the lake right now as the lake levels recede sometime. I can't speak to whether that's gonna be in two years or 20, but as those lake levels recede, the dune grass will trap the sand, the sand will start building those dunes outward, and the dune grass will propagate horizontally as well. Yes? Yeah, so you showed pictures of, I think it was Rogers, uh, where that was basically, yes. I assume it was kind of where that from. Yes. Um, yeah, they, what we normally would do is develop that, okay, where's the ordinary high water mark? How far back from that can we go to protect your investment and let the lake do its thing? Because we, we want the lake to do its thing. Um, you find that happy medium, you'll create a little scarp kind of. Um, you'll fill it in with the heavier riprap, you'll probably put some geotextile over it so that you can keep the, the sand and dirt on top of it um, and then plant it and it looks just like a dune. I mean, you, do you know there's a revetment down there? No, no. But it, I down to Concordia University yeah. and they've got a huge concrete structure built out into the lake. Um, so it, it does happen, but they're much more aware and that's been an educational process in the last 20 years. Yeah. You know, that was something new that we had been working on with them in 2000 with Sheboygan. It was like, well, just put a big break wall up and it's like, hang on, <laughs> that's a well, bad think, idea. Yeah, from a personal point of view, what happened with our system, and I, I think other people in the Bay did it as well. I don't the only ones that did it. But the dune created itself, and I would say it would take maybe five years before the dune really covered all our stones and our boulders, and then it just created this great area. And this, this is the year that we're beginning to see the boulders back. And then, uh, Rob, you came on to the Patriots, and Rob, we were very nervous. We got a, a call from my sister, I think, in March, and saying, I think we're in trouble. Um, and so we were very, very nervous, and we asked Roger to come back out looking at it, thinking that we would have to make another investment and say, no, you're going to be okay. Yeah. So, but it's, it's uh, done the job. And now, you know, the, the concern is, I, I see riprap. Yeah. Something's wrong. Well, it's, it's finally, 33 years later, starting to work. So That's what we need. So you didn't put uh, sand on top of it? No, no. We didn't do it. It was all natural. It came back. You would have never known. Uh, five years ago, you would have never known. We did five uh, families, so we did we get it together, we did a long thing, and then uh, uh, a couple of families uh, also did it. They they just did it, uh, uh, you know, they used someone else. I think uh, Kim Smith uh, from Lily Bay has been doing a lot of installation. So it just depends on who you use, but it's the same system. <coughs> now is that we, we're just beginning now to see our stones. What we've you noticed know, and what we've seen happening more and more in the last probably 15 years. Yeah is people want it to look nice immediately. You don't, don't just put riprap on our shoreline back far enough. Um, and we do the full systems with the geotextile. You can put sand in the dune grass on top of it and you'll probably see as we're doing the plantings, we'll have some of that green mesh that'll hold everything in place. Um, but it looks natural from the beginning. It just depends on, on how much investment you wanna make. If you wanna cover it with sand, we do the beach nourishment and it, it becomes natural instantly. Um, <laughs> it reminds me, I, I 
I live in Boston and I spend a lot of time on the ocean in Boston. It reminds me of the East Coast. Actually, that's what it looks like. Uh, yeah. It's a lot like around, um, around uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts shore about the bottom with the rocks. And that's what exactly what it looks like. And it's, it's okay. And we're just so used to having this big, beautiful beach. And it just looks a little bit more rugged. So. Yes, yes. <coughs> Oh, I'm t so there's Tina and then there's Tom back there. Okay, okay. Tina. Okay. Yeah. So many years ago, I asked humans about this, and I never knew anything about the mesh underneath when I talked to you. So we would just put rocks in front of those people. They started washing away. Tim Smith, or Tim, came this year and put more rocks. He never mentioned anything about this mesh thing. Well, um, the, the mesh is what we would put. It's, it's a geotextile fabric that we would put over the rocks in order to keep sand on top of the rocks. So we would put, we would put the... Um, yeah, if we were doing a true buried revetment, you can do an open-faced revetment, you can do a buried revetment. What we're designing more and more of these days is a buried revetment, where you put the revetment down, you cover it with a geotextile, and then you can put smaller cobbles or dirt or sand or whatever you'd like over the top, and it's buried immediately. It took them five years to bury it in sand naturally. We can do it in a week. So you can, you can bury those revetments. So my name is Steven Umentum, and I'm the naturalist at Whitefish Dunes, as well as at uh, Potawatomi State Park. Uh, this is my second summer working here. Um, and so we're happy that you guys invited us here, because we're neighbors, right? We share a couple miles of our park with you guys, with some of your homes. Um, we share some wildlife. We share our shoreline, what's left of it, right? Um, we also share, obviously, the lake. Um, and so uh, the big thing, obviously, is the lake level. And she already, you know, Sarah touched a lot on that. So we're seeing about you know, six feet in the last six years, right? A huge, drastic change. Um, and that's really affected our uh, park a bunch. So all that sand that she was talking about, we all sent that down to you guys, at least you know, partly, right? And so uh, we haven't seen levels like this since 1986. And I've got pictures of what our park looked like. And I wasn't even, I wasn't even born in 1986. Um, <laughs> but uh, but the, the, you know, the, beach, the beach was completely gone. We shut down the entire beach in 86. And so, uh, we're seeing that same kind of thing today when you compare the pictures of you know, July 4th, a few days ago, to July 4th of 1986. You are seeing the same kind of lake levels. So our first beach access is completely closed. Um, last year it was closed as well, but at least we had rocks there, right? Now that's all underwater. Um, our second beach access, where we have uh, kayak tours through a, a different company, they have their kayaks there, but their kayak stand fell into the water. So it's just rocks there now, so it's kind of a little island of rocks. Um, so the only place we really have a beach left is our third beach access. And we've got maybe 10 feet of beach right there. On July 4th, we had those waves coming in, so I could maybe lay down, you know, it was maybe six feet of beach. Um, so really, it's that third beach access, our dog beach, is the really, you know, the only beach that we have, that we have left um, for right now. Um, so as far as what the park is doing, we're trying to preserve that vegetation, kind of like Sarah had said, so that beach grass. Uh, when you compare, like, you know, the grass that's maybe in your backyard that's only a few inches of root depth, that beach grass has a couple feet. So it does a huge job of, of retaining that dune. Um, so we're doing our best to protect that vegetation, the trees, um, the dune thistle. So we're really protecting that vegetation. We're trying to keep people off the dunes. A huge issue we had last year was people wanting to take that shortcut. They wanted to skip that first beach access. So they just start walking through the middle of the dune in order to get to the second beach access. We were pretty quick on trying to keep those people in line. Um, so obviously, people stepping on the dune creates more erosion, um, kills off that vegetation. Um, so the same thing for you guys, try to keep people off of your dunes, what's left of them, right? And try to protect that vegetation. That's, that's the easiest, you know, simplest thing, obviously, um, that you can do. Um, we have no plan at this point to put in, you know, riprap or a revetment wall, to my knowledge at least. Um, obviously, we don't have homes that could potentially be destroyed in our parks. So that's a big difference between uh, you guys and us. Um, so right now, we're, we're kind of playing the long game. You know, we're looking at that 3,000 years and we're hoping that it's not going to take any more of our dune, right? Um, once again, though, we're in a different situation than you guys. Um, 
And touching on that, that dune thistle, about three quarters of the dune thistle in the state of Wisconsin is found on our beach, along with your guys' beach. So it's found right here in Whitefish Bay. So it's really important for us to try to protect that, um, but we are kind of letting nature run its course, if you will. Um, that's kind of our plan for right now. Um, having said that, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of programming at the dunes, and obviously our beach is our main attraction, and a lot of people have not done, you know, we've got people coming from South Dakota and Missouri, and they don't know what the lake levels are like, so they see some, they'll Google it and see the photos of this 100-foot beach, and they come here and they're, Where, where'd the beach go? So I'm the guy that, you know, they send them to me, and I try to explain what's going on, so I'm kind of, you know, mitigating, mitigating our, our visitors and, and their, uh, and their expectations. Um, but I'm trying to put on other programs to kind of show some of the other high points of our park. Um, so I do a hiking uh, trip every single week to different parts of our park. So actually in about 45 minutes, I'm doing a hike to Old Baldy. So I gotta get, I gotta get back to the park in a little bit. But um, Old Baldy's the tallest sand dune that we have in Wisconsin. So I do hikes there, I do hikes on the Black Loop, um, show people the Whitefish uh, Creek. The creek is beautiful, it goes right in your guys' backyards too for some of you. Um, so just trying to get some of our visitors into other areas and show them some of the other history of our park. Um, a big thing has been our native history. So we've got artifacts at the dunes that are, uh, some of which are 2,000 years old. Kind of a, I guess a, a good thing about this erosion is we're actually seeing some artifacts wash up from the dunes. We actually found a spear last year that was sticking out of the dune from that erosion. So some of you guys might find some, some cool things on the beach there. Um, so I've been kind of talking to more people about that native history. I built a wigwam last year on our red trail, so just kind of teach more people about the, the people who were here before us, the people of the dunes. Um, I'm doing programming on um, water quality, kind of what Sarah touched on with, as far as runoff. Um, so just trying to diversify our programming, talking about uh, mammals and having pelts for, for kids to touch and that kind of thing. So just giving people other experiences um, so that they're not just coming here and being disappointed, you know, giving them some other uh, you know, photo shoots and things where they can take some, take some memories home with them. Um, and so I have a list of my programs. I'll probably just email that to, to maybe to Mary Grace. Um, and so you guys can get, have access to all those programs. So today I'm doing a hike. Um, like I said, every week I do a hike. I do different programming. So you guys are all welcome to, to join. I hopefully I'll see uh, some of you guys out there um, around the visitor center or on a hike. Um, one other, uh, another big thing is that my position as a naturalist is completely funded by our friends group and through donations and through grants. And I know a lot of people in here have donated to that, so my position in the programming that I do wouldn't be possible without your generosity. So that's awesome that, 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 as, that I'm able to do this. Because um, I've had so many people already thank me and, and had, you know, had a good experience at the Dunes because of the programs that I put on, and that's thanks to you guys. It keeps people coming up here. Um, and not only my position, but um, a lot of our infrastructure and other investments we're making comes from donations. So we actually just got um, enough money to fix the Brachiopod Trail. We have a wetland with a boardwalk, um, which I believe has been out of commission for the last couple years. Um, and so that's going to get uh, rebuilt, hopefully by next spring. So for next summer, we'll have the Brachiopod Nature Trail back in, back in the works. So that's a really uh, beautiful trail. Um, and I can do programming on macroinvertebrates. I already go over there. I go, I'm allowed to go on the, on the boardwalk, so I'll go over there. It's kind of at like a 45 degree angle, so it's definitely not safe for the public. Please don't go on it. But it is beautiful back there. There's always uh, different waterfowl, amphibians, uh, great blue herons, um, that sort of thing. And so I'll, I'll get macroinvertebrates for the kids, but they don't get to see them in the wild. You know? So I gotta bring them all the way back into the woods for them. So having that boardwalk, though, will allow me to do a lot more programming. And like I said, it's all thanks to, to generosity of people like you. Um, and so I guess I'm going to pass it over uh, to Aaron. Um, I don't know if you want to, I can give you the mic. Yeah. OK, can everybody hear me OK? Loud enough? OK. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Dembski. I am currently filling in as the acting manager at Whitefish Dune State Park. There has been a vacancy there since last June uh, when the park manager left. So uh, as of October, of last year I've been helping out. I am permanently stationed at Point Beach State Forest, which is right along the lake shore. It's about an hour and a half drive south of here. Uh, so I've been coming up two to three days a week. Uh, I can answer as many questions if you have any as I can. I'm not from the area. I'm not real familiar with, with the area, um, but I can definitely let you know what's going on at uh, Whitefish Dunes as of now. Um, Steve pretty much covered everything, so I guess I can just leave. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, thank you very much. Uh, though he pretty much touched on a lot of the important things that are going on. Um, 
as far as the uh, high water levels, we, along with everything that Steve has said, we are trying to educate people uh, when they come to the nature center and explain to them, you know, the importance of, you know, staying off the dunes and, uh, and I think the most important part is just explaining to them why there is no beach that they came to see, um, which there, people have been disappointed. Again, you know, we do have information out there. We also have information on, uh, on the DNR uh, website for whitefish. Uh, just letting people know that there, there isn't much. There isn't much beach, so they aren't completely disappointed. But not that there isn't other things to see when they do come. Um, the master plan has been, uh, was, re, was redone, I believe, within the last year or two. Uh, there is, in that master plan, there is uh, plans to, I don't want to say create, there is a volunteer foot trail that, uh, that goes along the, um, that connects up with Cave Point, goes along the, um, the actual rock shoreline. Uh, that is in the master plan to be, uh, that a trail will be created. Uh, we do have to uh, write a development project and also have an engineer come out and take a look to see, you know, the the best way to do that without without ruining, you know, ruining any um, current vegetation, any you know, any natural um, anything natural that is there. And I think the other important thing that I was just going to touch on was with this uh, manager vacancy. They're whole they're hoping to fill it. Uh, by the end of this year. Now, with everything else, that probably you know could take a little bit longer. Uh, but uh, just coming here from Point Beach and working with the friends of Whitefish Dune State Park, um, it's amazing how how everybody has chipped in uh, from those you know the the volunteers and the um, the members of Whitefish Dune State Park. Um, it's unbelievable how. Everybody really, you know, chips chips in and helps together um, to, you know, make this make this transition possible. Um, and the I think the other thing I was going to touch on, which a lot of you probably don't know, there has been some changes in the department uh, as of 2018. Prior to 2018, uh, there was law enforcement uh, in Wisconsin State Parks and Forests. That has changed as of 2018. Changed a couple of times. Uh, as of this last year, there will there are still rangers. Uh, we are not credentialed anymore, so we don't have any you know arrest authority or um, any authority to write citations. Uh, but that law enforcement is being handled by the local wardens. So coverage wise. There's not the coverage that there has been in the past. Uh, we, we still continue to do, try to do what we, what we did um, as far as educating people, um, you know, giving some warnings if need be. If anything else needs to happen further than that, we will contact the local warden. Um, so I know there are, you know, there have been some issues I, along with Whitefish and everywhere else, there's issues. I know a big issue is dogs, dogs off leashes. There have been a couple incidents. Uh, so my suggestion is, if anybody has any concerns, please call the park. If you have any, you know, if there's any issues that you see that happen on the property, please call the park, talk to somebody, or leave a message. Um, so we know what is going on. A lot of times things happen and we don't even know because people don't let us know. Uh, but if you can relay any information to us that we can either look into further or pass that information on to the local warden or sheriff's department if need be, uh, it, would, it would be great, very, very helpful. Um, if you can get information, you know, if you do have some, if there's a, an emergency, get as much information as you can and definitely give us a call um, so we can, you know, so we can help take care of any issues. Uh, so uh, that's kind of a, a basic update as far as um, staffing and 
um, what's going on at Whitefish. Again, as, as well as what Steve had to say. Yeah, I mean, I can touch on that a little bit. Bob is, you know, an expert on this as well. Um, I'll just kind of just hold this. Um, so um, the mosquitoes have been have been terrible this summer. I think a lot of that's due. I mean, I worked here last summer, and they, I never had to to actually alter the hike for next week. It was supposed to go to the white uh, to the to the creek, right? And it's so buggy back there, I changed it to the Black Loop, which is kind of on the north side of the park, the north uh, east side of the park. So mosquitoes are a lot worse this summer. I'm wondering how much that is due to bats, but also a combination of the wet spring we've had. Um, but bats are definitely an issue. We didn't, Bob and I didn't do a bat count this summer yet, but uh, last summer in general, we have something called white nose syndrome, which has been going on for the past couple years. Uh, it's, a, it's a fungus. Uh, it was brought over from Europe, I believe, in like 2002 into New York, and it's been spreading by the bats. So it's a fungus that, um, gets kind of into the bat's skin and into their nose. Um, and when they should be hibernating, instead they're, they're waking up. It's like you're trying to imagine they're trying to sleep with their nose clogged, right? So they're waking up and trying to go back to sleep. Uh, but when they wake up, they need to try to feed themselves, but it's the middle of winter, right? So they fly out of the cave, they freeze, they die. And so um, Horseshoe Bay Cave, which is one of the largest caves in Wisconsin, used to have a population of 1,200 bats or so. I think last year there was seven bats there. Um, so our, our populations have just been devastated. Um, I know the bat box we have at the dunes is not occupied right now. Um, there's another, uh, there's a farm that we do, a, a barn that we do a bat count at up in uh, Jacksonport. Um, they had a population of about 150, down from 500 a few years ago. So that, there's still a population there, but in general, you're not gonna see bats as much just due to that, that white nose syndrome. I know there's been talks of uh, giving them a, a sort of like antibiotic uh, to kind of get rid of that fungus but it's like, how do you treat uh, hundreds of bats? You know, how do you get them little injections, right? Or, uh, but they talked about coating them with, with, uh, with a powder that would have this on there, and then they would lick it up, just like every mammal. You know, a lot of our cats and dogs, they, they do groom themselves, so then they would you know, eat that powder and then uh, vaccinate themselves. Um, there's also been talks about doing UV treatments to some of these caves to kill off that fungus, um, but that's just another, it's another struggle that we're going through, kind of along with the lake. There's these things that are happening, and we're doing our best to mitigate it, to try and control it. Um, but as of right now, our bat populations are in significant decline. Yes? Are there any wolves in this area? Um, that's, I had, I'm not like the, an expert on that, but we had Michelle Hefty, who's, uh, she's the park manager of Newport State Park. Um, we do have, there's been cases of juvenile wolves crossing um, Green Bay from northern Wisconsin, because um, wolves can travel I believe it's like 10 miles in a day. So obviously the, the bay is only six miles, eight miles across in some places. So there have been um, reports that they, there have been some wolf sightings in the last you know, couple years. I don't believe there were any last year in the last two or three years, but I know in 2014, I believe, there was a wolf that was um, shot in Southern Door, I wanna say. I'm not, don't quote me on that necessarily, but I believe there was a wolf that was shot because someone was coyote hunting. Um, and there are reports, we get a lot of reports of people seeing wolves and it ends up being coyotes, um, but it is, it is plausible that there could be wolves um, moving through the air, but there are no breeding populations, no wolf packs at this time, as far as my knowledge goes. Yes. Do you have any plans to like lobsterfish here? You know, I am not, Aaron can speak to that, I'm not. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it, I was discussing with the uh, superintendent from Potawatomi, Aaron Brown Stender, she oversees Whitefish dunes also. And we are losing some staff this year. Actually, we're losing staff before the event actually goes, is scheduled to happen. Um, so as of now, we have not talked to the friends group yet. We haven't had that discussion. This was just talked about within the last two days. Due to the lack of staffing, I don't believe we will be having it and the lack of, obviously, shoreline. Um, we, there's just, unfortunately, we just don't have the people. Um, if we want, we definitely would, you know, if we, if we could do it, uh, we're losing two of our s summer LTEs uh, who work about 40 hours a week. So they are both leaving right before the event happens. Uh, we just found that out. So I want, I'm going to say, it's, 
most likely not going to happen this year. Um, hopefully, hopefully when we get a manager, it will happen next year. Yeah, if we could, uh, we definitely would. We're we're trying we're trying to trying to figure out how to make it happen. And I just like I said, with two full time people leaving, um, it's it might be a little tough to try to pull off this year. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you guys.